Threads is a British TV movie from 1984 that builds up to a nuclear apocalypse and follows the few who survive into a bleak future. It's got a docudrama style and gets surprisingly dark, so let's head to the Fallout shelter and take a look. Welcome everyone to the Atomic Cinema Experiment. I am Peter and joining me as always is Tara. Hello. What was that sultry hello? <laughs> I I didn't plan on sultry. It just happens naturally. Uh, so you did a pause <laughs> and you did a little head bob and sort of like, not, not a wink, but like, a, like an eyebrow raise. Uh, I the did camera. a wink. Hello. <laughs> uh, we should be charging for that. That's that's, that's male fuzz only fans content right there. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a science fiction movie podcast. Uh, we get together. We're working through post-apocalyptic movies. We're doing a little mini season of those. Um, this is our second of those, and this is a movie from 1984 called Threads, which I had never heard of. I don't think Tara had ever heard of. But when we went looking for you- post-apocalyptic movies. This ended up. Uh, you know, popping up on a lot of the lists that we're looking at. So I was like, all right, so th- this ended up being in the vote. This was their patrons' vote episode, and they picked this over uh, things I can't remember. It's been too long since that vote was up, but Threads won. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about. We'll start spoiler free as we always do, and we'll give you a warning before we get to the spoilers. Uh, oh, we should, uh, you know, I put an announcement video, but we probably should mention on the show itself that you will be vacating the show and. That is correct. About 10 episodes, give or take. Um, I'd have to go back and count. Let the countdown begin. But uh, it's probably worth mentioning it every so often on the show so people who just listen to the audio feed actually know that uh, the change is coming. Uh, The show will continue, um, but with someone who doesn't wink as nicely as Tara does uh, in the (laughs) other seat. You don't, have you, has David winked at you before? He hasn't, but I don't want him to. (laughs) <laughs> if he does it, I might give him a stern talking to. If only I could do to. it as nicely as Red Brown. <laughs> Don't move. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, we'll get into Threads, uh, the the post-apocalyptic uh, movie, which obviously you said to me when you started watching this that it didn't feel like it was a post-apocalyptic movie uh, because the, the civilization was still very much functioning but it is a movie that builds up to the apocalypse and then keeps going after the apocalypse. So I think enough of it's afterwards that I see why it pops up on post-apocalypse because it kind of really does jump ahead and sort of look at the after effects. It's not, if it was just like the last 10, like let's say the apocalypse happened in the third act and there was only like 10 minutes afterwards, I would probably dispute if this should count as post-apocalyptic. But I think like the entire last hour uh, is, you know, post-apocalypse so yeah it um i still think the post-apocalypse thing is mostly the last like 20 minutes because i would say dealing with the immediate aftermath happens at the hour mark you know and then you're arguing that's still the apocalypse (sighs) yes (laughs) Okay. I think of when I think of post-apocalyptic, I think like the next generation, at least. Okay. You know? Okay. All right. I mean, people I, who are people who are living in this world who have like, oh, like, uh, gangs have now popped up, cannibalism, you know, all the usual stuff. Yeah, I, I can get your argument. I, I I see why this pops up though. When it comes to this topic, I see why yes. this this pops up on these lists. Uh, so we'll get into all I will, that. I will course. say I'm a little on the fence about this being a post-apocalyptic movie, but I'm I'm still okay with it. Okay. Well, I, I mean, if it shows up on list, I, I won't be like no. You know, I won't I won't fight on that the, hill. I mean, the patrons voted for it, so even if even if we watched it and went no, I wouldn't consider that post-apocalyptic. We still have to do it anyway. So it's, it's a, <laughs> that would just be the the story of the review. I I, I do <laughs> think enough of it is post-apocalyptic to to kind of count. Although most post-apocalyptic stories, you may get a little bit of a flashback, you may get a little bit at the start, but t- typically they do just start when they post. You know, we're, we're already like settled after said apocalypse. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is very much not that. This this is a little bit of the 
obviously it's not based on a true story, but it's it's, it's got a little bit of Chernobyl in it, and that it's kind of like I was feeling Chernobyl big time watching yeah. the last hour of this. Yeah, once it's like talking about you know radioactive effects and fallout and like it it, it, it does have a very docudrama kind of approach. There's even a narrator. There's captions that come up basically saying, "Hey, one day after, here's the things that are going to be." affecting the population here's what's going to happen so on so on so uh but yeah so i mean the the premise of the movie is that we kind of follow this young couple in present day 1984 sheffield england who are sort of just starting their life together and we're introduced to their two families in fact so the, the couple's uh ruth and jimmy and i think every character in this movie will probably refer to as related to them because i don't know any of their names but it's you, you, you meet both their parents and their like siblings and whatever and they've got like their own little threads <laughs> in the movie so uh but nice. basically over the course of the first hour you hear just in the background those like oh there's those tension rising in the cold war between the u.s and the soviets and it, it, it kind of keeps escalating and obviously like i don't think it's a spoiler to say there's going to be a nuclear bomb or two that's just kind of what the whole premise of the movie is, but we'll we'll, we'll leave it there. We'll we'll see how we feel. This this we'll is in our post apocalyptic month or season, whatever it is. It would be yeah, it would be very <laughs> weird if we tried to hide. Oh yeah, there might be a, an apocalypse in this. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, uh, all right, okay. Well, what did you think that? And we should also mention this is a TV movie. Actually, before we go any further, uh, so it's four by three, and I don't know. I mean, I assume it was on the BBC in 1984, but I do not know. Uh, but it's, it's just one of those on things. Tubi now. <laughs> it is one of those things, though, where it was popping up. Like, every single, you know, top 10 post-apocalyptic movie list that we looked at looking for options, like, this was popping up on a lot of them. So, anyway. Tara, what did you think of Threats? I was pretty unsure in the beginning of it because uh, it did not feel like a post-apocalyptic film. And it felt like we were spending way too much time before anything happens um, where I was just super bored and didn't really care all that much because it it also has this very educational vibe to it. Like you said, it's kind of like a docudrama with the narrator and stuff like that. And I'm like, what is this vibe that it's giving off? I'm not sure. But after the events happen, things get real crazy and real dark and real interesting and i actually really like the structure of it and i like the uh docudrama feel of it i like the narration um i actually very much enjoyed this movie much more than i thought i was going into it yeah i think the first half feel because i think the first half like is successful in feeling like, it's a bunch of real people you're watching. They're not really, but it feels like they're real people. Like they feel really down-to-earth, mm -hmm. working-class people in Sheffield. And I think that it's almost intentionally kind of dull and boring in how it presents them for the first hour, because the whole point is, no, these are regular people who are going to be thrust into this <laughs> tragedy, this crisis that, like, is yeah. so different. And it, ma it made the crisis feel like a bigger deal, that it was these regular... This wasn't some, like, action hero who are seeing you know, it's not the rock making his breakfast and going about his day-to-day -day office life but he's the rock so when you know the bombs fall okay he's going to turn into action man and he's going to you know flex those muscles it's not yes. that it's it's regular joe schmoes and you know people who are you know with normal dull boring problems yeah and, and like, you, can, you can hear like the news and stuff in the background of people talking about escalations and other governments you know like obviously america and russia and the middle east and stuff like that so you can hear it all going on in the background and you understand what they're setting up but you know people are sort of half taking it seriously but it, it is so realistic that i'm just like okay can we get to it already <laughs> but i think uh, if i were to go back and watch it again i actually would enjoy that stuff more i, I think it yeah it makes everything in the back half it harder and like you said it gets shockingly dark for for something that aired on TV yeah. in 1984. <clears throat> um, this this goes into some pretty depressing visuals, and it's honestly when I put up the road episode last week, my title on YouTube was the most depressing post apocalyptic movie <laughs> question mark ever, and I don't know. This may actually be more depressing <laughs> by the end. Yeah, I it is definitely uh, 
darker, much more depressing, but um, more fun to watch than The Road. Oh, okay. So that's, that's saying something. <laughs> All right, okay. Well, well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll get into all the details in a bit, but uh, yeah, I, I think. You know, obviously, it, it pulls all these little tricks. You know, it uses still frames sometimes, you know, to sort of get... Almost that uh, Legiti kind of vibe, where it'll show you, like, this depressing image of a, an apocalypse where it would cost too much to actually do something on this scale in camera mm-hmm. for a, a TV movie. So they kind of just set up a still frame of it and have it look grainy and kind of, like, you know, grimy and have the narrator say something over it and it kind of works. Um, but that said, there is a lot of in-camera stuff too. There's a lot of, um, you know, people walking around debris and things like that. And yeah, a lot of like models, of people on fire. <laughs> There's a <laughs> lot of corpses. There is a lot of corpses. so many corpses in this. Uh, you know, and they're, they're, they're like burned corpses as well. So these charred, just like skeletons and like just yeah, you know, real nasty. It's it definitely has bite to it, which. Mm-hmm is impressive um I, I wasn't sure what i was expecting from this to be honest um i think a lot of the posters have like the the image of like a what looks like a soldier with like, this bandage over like, the top half of his face and I, th- I kept thinking he was going to be like a, a big character in the second half once we got to all the apocalypse stuff but he is literally just like there in one scene pretty much yeah he, he's not like a prominent character at all they just realized that was a good visual and that's what they're going to slap on the posters yeah so you know um but yeah um yeah surprisingly effective um and it tackles the logistics quite a bit i think one of the my favorite things that it does is that it it kind of just gives you the sense that time passes and then certain characters are just dead like it you know i won't spoil who or what here but there's definitely moments in this where You'll every so often we're jumping around all these different characters, and then eventually you'll just stop jumping to one of them, and then event you know, and then a bit later you'll see someone else go to where they are, or you'll see something else that reveals that oh they've been dead for a while, like they've just already mm-hmm. been gone. And the movie doesn't show you a dramatic death scene; it just kind of like oh, like people are just dying left and right, and you're not aware of it. It's kind of like putting you in the shoes of people not knowing if their loved ones are already dead and things like that. Uh, which is yeah. a big part of the movie as well. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I, I enjoy the, um, kind of the, the chutzpah of the film, you know? <laughs> the movie's got, the, the movie actually has quite a lot of, uh, a lot of balls. <laughs> a lot. Or I think teeth. You said teeth, right? I said teeth, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, there is, uh, there is real, like, um, the, not dramatic license but like the the style of the storytelling i think is kind of daring um in that it it could have lost me you know if i wasn't watching this for the show um in the first half of the film i might have been like "Eh, i mean i don't think this is for me (laughs) or something and changed the channel but i i think it it does pay off with how with its realism and um with the uh, the style of storytelling. I had a different point, but I lost it. I'm sorry. Distracted by a cat. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it comes back, you feel free to uh, interject. I'm sorry. <laughs> I blame you. Well, now I've got nothing at the ready because I thought you were going to make a point and I was going to, well, I'll, I'll respond to whatever Tara says. <laughs> what, what were you talking about before? Uh... <laughs> Movie's got teeth or balls or both. <laughs> it does, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think you know, there's little, there's little touches as well in the direction that they, they go and it, they do make it feel like a film as opposed to something. Because I think when you look at something made for TV, especially you know in the nineties and in this case the eighties, you do get like a very like basic shooting style. You get just the coverage and no more. This mm-hmm. does actually have cinematic little moments where it'll focus on the photo of a wife in the foreground or it'll uh, look at something else to sort of create a more sort of uh, minimalist moment or even like a a somber moment by just you know focusing on an item that kind of tells you part of the story separate from what the the characters are doing in the scene or something you know 
Mm-hmm. It's very efficient and it's very smart with how it uses its things, even though it does feel very different to the vast majority of what we think of as how movies are told. Yeah, it reminds me a bit of like educational films that you would watch in school or something like that. I think also it, it came out the same year as like 1984, mm-hmm. the BBC movie, or not, well, British movie. Yeah, it wasn't, um, I don't think it was BBC, but yeah, British movie. <laughs> But it was British, yeah. So, I, and it kind of has the same dour vibe to it and look to it, and obviously sound. <laughs> but I think the, um, yeah, it reminds me of something that you would watch like an educational film, like with the narrator. He's not, you know, full Attenborough or anything, but he's, um, it's, it's like a something you would, the like, teacher would put on for like a week while you, while you, uh, <laughs> Well, well, they like nap behind the desk or something. So <laughs> you can watch this uh, film, and it's it's very much like um. Uh, dang it! I did it again. We shouldn't we shouldn't record at this time of day. <laughs> I thought you were the morning person. <laughs> oh, I'm just distracted. Um. Well, on on it having a similar feel to 1984, I will say. The, I agree in part, kind of with the dourness. Although I think it's very clear that that's a film that was made as like a, a theater release, and that this is a TV movie. Just in the, in the quality of the of the the footage, the quality of like the the production design, and that's not to say that this doesn't have a lot of work put into it to like do a lot of its like destruction destruction scenes and things like that. But it definitely like the early stuff when it is just normal present day do look like a like a British TV show of that time period. Mm-hmm. Whereas 1984 never does. 1984 always felt like a, a movie. I think that was Deacons, right? Roger Deacons did that. Like one of his early works too. I so don't remember, but that so- probably would help make it feel like a, like a theatrical film. There was something else I was thinking about this being the same year as, and I've, it's, it's escaped me, but you, you made, you made, you made me think of it there. Cause you said that this was the same year as 1984. There was, while I was watching it, there was something in my head where it's, oh, it's weird are, that this is the same. Are you doing like a 1984 watch list or something? Yeah, yeah, but that's not what I'm talking about. Um, mm. I'm not talking about that. But there was definitely something that popped out in my head while I was watching it that was goes, oh, it's weird that this is the same year as that. Um, and I'm not sure now what I was thinking about, but you've annoyingly made me remember that I had that thought because you brought up 1984. <laughs> I'm glad it's not just me today. <laughs> Yeah, but you've done it twice. <laughs> and I was able to give more information, so I won. All right, fine. <laughs> God, well, come on, what else you like about it? Um, I think the, uh, the actual, like, shooting of everything that ha- happens with the, uh, with, with the bomb, like, I think it's really clever and more impressive than I thought it would be. We've kind of already talked about it a bit, but like the actual set designs and trick camera tricks that they do are, are really clever and creative and it does feel big, like a like a massive explosion. I think and even- what surprised me is that I wasn't like I was expecting just a flash of light. I wasn't expecting anything else, right? Mm-hmm. And but you do actually see a mushroom cloud, and it's not like. And even if you told me that before I watched that, I'd have been like, "Ah, oh, it'll be stock footage of a mushroom cloud. It'll, you know, that's all it'll be." But whether or not they did their own effect or not, I'm not sure if it is just like a stock bit of footage. But they superimpose it with the skyline to like at least like there's there's a shot of people looking over and seeing a mushroom cloud, and it's there. You see it, and I was surprised mm-hmm. by that. And then they do all the other tricks as well. They do the flash of light. Um, and they do that sort of repeated flash of light thing as well, where there's like all these like things happening in between, um, and it does have this kind of heavy, like, weight to it, where it does feel like I think everyone I just was looking at in that previous second is is definitely dead because mm-hmm. how could they otherwise survive? You see, like uh, parts of buildings fall on people, and like. Uh... Yeah, and and the I mean the way it's done was at first was kind of annoying because it was like a, a countdown or like a build up, and I'm like I'm not like keeping track of all these days that they're telling me, so like whatever. But and and then it but then it does like kick in like oh like you know 
this this amount of time has passed and now these are the things that you can expect to see or this is the thing that uh, has run out and um, these are the diseases that have popped up and things like that that i thought was oh now i now i enjoy that format <laughs> yeah yeah uh it's worth mentioning that the title in the movie says threads and then says by barry hines and that's the writer not the director so this, this is you know british tv is always uh, like prop, propped up the writer more than the director of, of, of stuff for whatever reason um, and that's not to say that I don't think the writer should have uh, uh, all the praise in the world but I think the director and the writer should get, get, get praise it's just weird to ignore the director when I feel like all these little visual touches and the way it's shot and things like that, that's the director that's uh, at the, the head of all that Well, maybe, maybe it's a writer that's more well known than you know for someone like oh maybe us. I don't know <laughs> <laughs> or maybe this, uh, whatever. Maybe this is based on some source material that was well known. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Barry Hines seems to have a bunch of writing credits. Uh, although his last thing was in 1992, so although the price spread out by the looks of it, like his first things in 1969 and his last things in 1992. Are you just looking at IMDb? Yeah. So that's just his film or whatever he's linked to. True, true, yeah. Um, he could be an author as well. Yeah. That's entirely possible. Maybe yeah. he is like in Attenborough, but for nuclear fallout and war. <laughs> um, well, that's kind of weird because you, you said that about the narrator earlier. Do, do you yeah, but Attenborough he... was a like a biologist, a naturalist, and a prolific writer, but also did the narration for, um, you know, all the animal stuff and nature documentaries oh that's fair I, i'm just uh in, in the context of the show though you already re referenced attenborough as the narrator so i'm just I'm, I'm making that clear distinction between the two things okay yeah i don't think this guy is the narrator he maybe he is and i missed it but <laughs> i don't know i'm looking no the narrator is paul vaughn whoever that is <clears throat> good voice it's a pretty generic TV but I like that voice. because it sounds like an educational oh, yeah. film that you would watch on TV. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm, I'm not. Um, uh, yeah, that wasn't a critique. That, that, that that's you know, part. That's part of it. Like part of the reason why this movie is so effective is because it does feel like this. Like you're, real you're in the future thing. watching the past thing that happened, and you're like, "Oh, humanity made its mistake. Here's the lead up, and here's what happened after." Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's clearly the feel they're going for. They're going for the sort of thing that you would show in a school to show the effects of something, it just so happens that this has never happened, really. You know, yes. and it's theoretical. Um, right. You know, obviously, yes, Japan was hit with two nuclear bombs, but that was a little different, and... Um, this seems to be the whole world. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, it seems to be. But honestly, like, we hear so much about the Soviets and the US in the first half and the news in the background. Once the apocalypse hits, you never hear anything yeah. about the rest of the world we have no idea if the us and russia are also nuked we have no idea if the rest of europe's nuked we do not yeah. know we don't know we can kind of infer because we do hear on the radio like i think it's the day before everything happens that two nukes were dropped in the middle east so that's the only thing that i think we hear and yeah, then that's we the only thing we know that, yeah that causes the all the nukes to go off and that's the yeah that's the start of the chain reaction would, seemingly yeah why else would you know the uk get hit yeah. unless they were just firing everything well well no there is a reason why sheffield's hit specifically they do, they do give you a reason in the movie oh, i missed it then <laughs> well i'll tell you in spoilers otherwise it uh okay <laughs> uh here um but yeah like but you don't you never hear about the rest of the world the fact that no one comes to help would make me think that the rest of the world is also in a similar position. Because you, I would like to think if the UK was hit with some nukes, that the, all the allied countries uh, might, <laughs> might send some boats with supplies, food, emergency services, yeah, things it, of that nature. Yeah, you don't nature. see like, planes going overhead afterwards either, so like, no, you would think there no. would be war <laughs> going on. Well, that's, that's what they always say about uh, a nuclear war, is that it would be quick. <laughs> like, it wouldn't yeah. be this prolonged <laughs> thing. It would be over quite quickly. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. 
um it is kind of funny though watching this um as the perspective of someone in the uk no no obviously i'm scottish i'm not english never mind from sheffield which is a very specific no one ever talks about sheffield <laughs> this is this just this it's like workman country england uh but it's it's funny watching a movie about this happening that's not from the u.s because it has this kind of like perspective of oh if this all happens it's not really because of us <laughs> mm-hmm. it's these it's these two other powers that are having this pissing contest it's and, it's very the day the earth caught fire yeah we're going to be caught in the middle of this shit because mm-hmm. obviously yeah we're allied with the u.s and that's something that comes up but like it is very much the well if this all goes down like because i feel like you know obviously yeah day the earth caught fire is a good example of like you know the uk being caught in the crossfire well not just the uk that's the whole world that's affected in that but um, we only get it from the perspective of yeah some people in the uk though in england i think but you know typically when you're talking about the threat of nuclear war it tends to be you know it tends to be like a u.s thing it tends to be oh we're in this this fight and we're or, you know, do we press the button to launch the nukes or do we, or do we not? And I think it's interesting to get it from the perspective of, so, of of some place that has no button. We don't have any mm-hmm. nukes to fire. I mean, maybe we do. I don't know. But, like, it's certainly not in the same way that, you know, that you think of the Cold War and you think of the two mega powers that are actually fighting. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an interesting perspective to, to watch mm-hmm. it from that. So... Um, I, I'll, I'll say spoilers, though, so we can get into everything and, and talk about stuff. Uh, so spoilers for threads from this point on. Um, what I was getting at before when I said that they do give us a reason why Sheffield specifically is hit is they establish early on that there is an RAF base, like a, you know, like a, which is the RAF's like the the, the air force of the UK basically. Um, mm. But it meant, we do see the the jets taking off. Yeah, well, it meant, yeah, but it also mentions specifically that it's used for US jets as well. That the US military use this place as a I see as okay, a stopgap. Yeah. Uh, when they're flying into Europe and stuff. So mm-hmm. they do give us a direct reason why this is a target. This is a military target. That's uh, true. We do have bases all over the world. Yeah. So, you know, that, I mean, that makes sense. Uh, the, so that, that that gives you, not that you really need one really, but it just gives you enough to know that's why this city specifically is hit because there is a direct thing that the Soviets would say, we want to stop this because we know they've got planes there. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, do you need that? You probably don't, but it's enough. It, especially in that first half of the movie where you're building up to it and you're like getting all the clues as to where this is going. It's like, okay, that's why they might hit here. And they're, you know, and I, I, one of my favorite things about the first half is that this is all happening in the news in the background of this. And it's the same reporter who keeps coming on and talking about what's happening. And does... Doesn't she kind of look like Kate Blanchett? Eh? Uh, oh, come on. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, it never occurred to me. But, I like that when this first starts, no one pays attention to it. No one's paying attention to a thing she's saying. It's, ah, the Soviets in the US are squabbling over something again. Everyone just ignores it. But then gradually over the course of the movie, they start paying more attention. They start like wanting to pay attention to the news what it's on. And they're getting mm-hmm. a little scared and taking it more seriously. People are starting to buy some canned food and whatnot. Yes, yes, there's there's chaos in the supermarkets. Um, and we lived through COVID, so we can uh, relate to at least a little bit of that. I was looking for the toilet paper. <laughs> um, maybe that's the one thing I didn't predict, is obviously these post-apocalyptic stories, it's always our food becomes the main currency of the world. But no one's talking about the toilet paper. It wasn't until COVID <laughs> where everyone realized, wait a minute, toilet paper is going to be the most sought-after thing <laughs> on the planet after food. <laughs> That's what all the bunkers are going to be filled with now. <laughs> yeah, because the first half of the movie, like, I mean, from the, the logistical side of things, it sets up like, okay, there's this crisis plan in place that if stuff happens, um, like, there's this, every, every city's got someone that's designated to be the leader of the crisis, like, group. And they sort of introduced to this character who, and he's just, he did have a government job, but it wasn't like he was, like, a military guy or, or, or like, he was even in charge of anything like that before. I want to say it was more like, Oh, like under city council or yeah. something, they have like a, a basement area where it, people would get together. No, but on top of the guy specifically, his, his job was like, uh, oh, he's like the parks department, like superior or something like that. Something like, he, like that. He, he yeah. wasn't someone who you would think is the guy. He's a zoning who's, guy. <laughs> he, he wasn't the guy you think, oh, he's going to be making the decisions that are life and death. 
uh, when things go down. <laughs> but when they put this plan into action and he's like getting all these other people and many of them, the movie points out, didn't know that they had these roles assigned to them in advance. Like, you know, it's like, so they, they, they all like gather in this basement of the town hall or whatever it is to sort of run the, you know, basically the, the, the government of the post-apocalypse where after the crisis happens, they have to make all the decisions but they're trapped down there, right? And, the, you know, obviously the building above has been blown up and even if they've been protected from the explosion, like, they're not protected from the fallout. They're not protected from the radiation coming down through the vents or or anything like that. This is not an mm-hmm. actual bunker. It's just a basement. Um, but they set up, you know, this guy, they set up the fact that he's sending his wife off to uh, live in the country somewhere. And that's actually one of my little favourite moments of direction is in the second half when he's, like, they're talking about the, the radiation and the like where's you know who like they look at the map and they've got circles saying everyone in this circle's dead everyone in this circle's 50 50 and he points to location and he says what about here and the guy's like well probably quite bad depending on the wind you know it could be this many rads or whatever and as he's saying this it cuts to a shot of his wife on the desk so even if you didn't already clock that he's asking about this location because that's where he sent his wife the camera yeah. work tells you and you know it's uh it's just an effective little moment yeah it is effective and then he has to like put it aside in order to get back to business you know people are depending on him I, it's a good i guess it is a good distraction during the apocalypse to be like okay i've got work to do yeah everyone's got work to do and i'm just sticking with this thread of uh all these guys Stop working on the that. building it's a word do you use <laughs> it's a plot thread <laughs> <laughs> but you know they're getting agitated they're having to ration their food they're talking about cutting people down to 500 calories a day to ration what they've got they're waiting for to be dug out of this place and they're having to make all these decisions and they're basically communicating everything via radio because that's all they've got but this was one of the examples of eventually you just like see guys like going through rubble and then you realize they're going down to this area and everyone down in this basement who was making decisions just 10 minutes ago in the context of the movie are all dead because this is like you know a month after now or whatever it is by the time mm-hmm. we get to this point but they've all starved to death down here like they were making decisions for like you know two or three weeks in the crisis but they eventually just all died and it's like all of a sudden all these characters we were following down here solving the problems are just gone and mm-hmm. that's something this movie does a number of times in the second half where people are just dead um after the fact yeah i mean when we right before we started recording i I asked you like did i miss the boyfriend dying (laughs) because i i couldn't remember i i was watching the film and and then he just wasn't in it anymore and i thought he was the main character so i was like wait what did i did i miss it did he die of radiation poisoning and i mean i must have just like blinked and missed it well he didn't miss anything he he literally died in the flash of the nuke going off (laughs) yeah <laughs> so if, i mean I, like uh, it's a bit silly to just not assume he's dead <laughs> i guess is what I'll say. well he survives the first one because there's two that happen and he well he he's outside when it happens he's like buying lumber off a guy and like hides under a truck and but the explosion is still kind of far away yeah it's because he gets out under the truck and he he gets out from the truck and he sees the the mushroom cloud off in the distance yeah and he's running through the street but then he's running through the street and there's the flash of light and then there's multiple flashes of light and you see like all the bit like basically he's saying that all the characters we've been following they're all a safe distance from the first one maybe not from like the fallout but certainly from the blast Mm -hmm. and then the second one goes off in the middle of the city and he's literally running down the street when this flash of light goes off. So he's just, okay, he's yeah. obliterated into atoms. Like he's, he's nothing <laughs> left of him. Yep. So that's what happened to him. Our main character. <laughs> well, I, I mean, you're saying that. Like, I mean, I was going to save the couple and leave them till last to talk about, but, you, but you've brought us on to him. So we'll talk about the couple. Um, so he's Jimmy and Ruth. Is the is the girlfriend? They were interested in them in the opening scene, and they're in a car and they're looking down at the city. They're up on a hill, which is kind of like a foreshadowing thing because he's like, "Hey, I'm trying to see if I can see my house," and it's like, you know, and there's, there's a bit of irony there because you're, you're seeing the entire skyline of the city because this this thing's going to be obliterated later on. So it's like, mm-hmm. hey, this is what it looks like functioning. <laughs> this is what it looks like with all the buildings intact because we're going to destroy this later. Um, but it sets up that they're in a relationship 
Um, and then the next time you see them, it's clear that she's pregnant. And then it's like about them, like, you know, you know, the parents have found out. Although they are telling us the dates as this is happening. And like, he's having the conversation with his parents about what to do about knocking her up the day after she told him. It's the next, and I'm like, would you really tell your parents the very next day? Like, surely you'd keep that to your, you could keep that to yourself for a couple of weeks. Because <laughs> the parents even say, the parents even say to him, oh, have you talked about all your options? They're like, yeah, yeah, we want to keep it. I'm like, it's been a day. <laughs> this, this... I mean, I guess if they already know they want to keep it, then might as well, you know, talk to the experts I, in your I, life, I, the people who have had a kid. I got confused about what age they were supposed to be because the way he was talking to his parents about it made it feel like they were still teenagers, but they don't look like teenagers and they immediately like go and like get a, an apartment together because they're going to get married. And I was like, okay, I guess they are older, but they're just both living with their parents and still getting their input yeah, on everything. I mean, they're young lovers, right? So they're probably right out of high school or something. Yes. You don't hear, they don't talk about school, so they must be Never. out. No. Oh, that's not the only example in this movie of someone not looking the right age. That's right at the end of the movie, but I'll talk about yes. that uh, <laughs> later. Um, so, so we're interested in this couple. We're interested in the fact that they've got a baby on the way, and they're relatively happy. Although there is a, an interesting little tangent where he does cheat on her uh, because his friend convinces him to like chat up some some ladies in the pub, uh, and they, he ends up having sex with this other woman, and it's just kind of glossed over. Um, it's this mentality that I've seen in a lot of movies that I, I've never understood who thinks this way, is that, well, until you're actually married, you're still single. Yeah. And I'm like, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> no, why don't you ask Ruth if how she feels about that, and we'll, we'll see what her reaction is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is Ruth still single also? Or? <laughs> yeah. So, somehow I, I doubt she's uh, also chatting someone up whilst pregnant with your child. Mm -hmm. Um, But, yes, so... All of this is to say, though, that it sets up that he likes birds, uh, not women. Uh, well, he likes women too, <laughs> but he likes uh, actual he likes birds. The birds. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's, you know, he goes to this aviary and he's, he's got books on birds and all that stuff. And she, you know, she she seems to come from a slightly more well-off family. Her parents seem a bit more posh. His parents feel a bit more working class. Mm -hmm. uh, they set up that he's got a little brother who's still a kid and. Also, a sister who's like a teenager, although she's only in like one scene in the whole movie. Like, she never pops up again, I don't think. I actually thought that she was the same as the younger brother at first. I'm like, is that the same character? <laughs> no, because they're in the same scene together. The kid's playing his little game and she's like brushing her mm -hmm. hair up at the up at the mirror. But I feel like we saw one of them at like a store or something before. And then um, she, showed, she shows up again at the dinner scene. I'm like, oh, okay, so they're related. Unless it was the brother and I thought it was the same person. Like I initially thought. Oh no, no big deal. I'll be honest, I am confused by what mistake you're making here because I don't understand. I guess I just made the own, my own movie in my head the whole time I watched it. I don't, but I don't understand how the young boy with the mushroom, like, dark hair and the blonde teenage girl, I don't understand how you thought well, they were the same character. Well then we must have seen her in another scene then. But why would that make you think she's the same as the brother? I don't understand. Um, I guess I thought that his interaction with a younger sibling was, was the same person. I don't understand any of this. I, 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 Whatever. <laughs> I'm, conf I'm confused <laughs> by the whole conversation, quite frankly. Well, you said she was only in one scene, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure she was in two. Oh, maybe but she was in another scene, but, she, <laughs> but I still don't understand how that makes her confused for the brother. I, I honestly, I don't remember the younger brother at all. <laughs> the younger brother's who the parents find dead later on with his feet sticking out the rubble. Ah. Uh, oh, yeah. And then the dad eventually dies holding his son's little game thing that he was playing. 1984's I, Cut I, and Edge I Technology. I the game, yes. <laughs> I do remember the game. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm glad you remember something. Yeah, it's coming back to me now. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, anyway, right, so, they set all this up, and he just, yeah, he just runs, he was basically running towards Ruth, he wants to go find Ruth and see if she's okay after the first blast, and then the flash of light happens, and that's when you just get all these flashes of light, and everyone's just dying, 
and mm-hmm. Ruth is is with her parents at their place and they're in the basement so they've fared quite well they've brought their grandmother in as well because one of the plot points before this is that all the hospitals um in prep for a disaster have basically get rid of all their patients and sent them all home so this grandmother is like with them in the basement and they're surviving and that's like one of the groups we keep cutting back to in the aftermath of the explosions um and this stuff is you know she's ruth is crying she says she doesn't want this baby she wishes it was dead because it's going to be deformed yeah mutant baby come on and it's you know i mean you, you i mean you're rubbing your hands together but it's presented very realistically in this so it's quite depressing when she it is when yeah. she says this i was uh, kind of hoping for a mutant baby and she eventually just kind of leaves her parents and wanders off uh I guess hoping to find Jimmy because she goes to their place. Um, and it's worth mentioning every character in this movie eventually dies. Like every single one of them ends up dead. Like her parents end up being killed by looters. You don't see this. You just see the looters leave the the building and then the police grab them and they just mention, oh, there's a couple in there with their heads bashed in. Um, because at this point people are looting for food and they're robbing from mm-hmm. each other. So it's it's getting into all that stuff. Um, uh, like. Jimmy's parents, the mum's like already like half dead after the blast. Like she's like missing half her hair and she's looking very sick. Uh, yes, the makeup's really good in this too. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. Uh, and then eventually the dad like outlives her by quite a bit, but he eventually just dies next to like a campfire like a month later. Just kind of, mm-hmm. you know, um, it's like everyone dies. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah, this is a real dark, dark movie. <laughs> I mean, there's a scene, there's a scene after she goes wandering off where Ruth is just going through the streets and like there's just like a thick cloud of like you know dust and dirt and fog and whatever and she's like wandering through and just seeing people she sees like a kid looking for his mom at one point there's sad music like, there's not a lot of music in the movie but there's sad music playing during this scene and then she sees like a woman holding a dead baby and it's yeah. just this burned dead baby in this woman's arms as this woman looks up at her like and just stares it's, right at her there's also like a like a mom or a lady anyway she looks like a mother's age who's just kind of like wandering mindlessly. And then a, a kid, like maybe like a six year old or something looking around for his mummy. But like, she's gone. Like she's mentally checked out and like just abandoning her kid. That's what I got from that scene anyway. So like she's wandering around and she's seeing all these mother child relationships post apocalypse. And it's just nothing but a, a dour <laughs> future for her yeah and obviously she's and her you know ruth in her head this entire time is like i've got i'm pregnant i've got a, i've got a baby on the way and this is the yeah. world that the baby's going to come into um i don't know how pregnant she is she's very clearly pregnant like she's she's larger at this point so she's pretty pregnant but yeah so th- there's no like no not at this point oh really this is like a week after the blast she's not she's not showing yet oh i thought she was showing no, no, she doesn't show till later. She shows, you know, Maybe she's just so covered up that I could tell. I thought she was like holding her belly while she was going through here. No, because it, it cuts ahead to like a month or two later, and she's starting to show. And this is when she's like working, and they're trying to like, uh, you know, pick up the crops or you know, whatever crops are left that have survived the the explosions and the fallout. Like she's working and she trips and stuff. Um, and just to sort of stick with this through line, she eventually gives birth. You know later that year um by herself there's no one else there she just spits out this baby and with tremendous pain and holds the baby and the baby and i thought this was <laughs> naively i thought the movie was going to be hopeful here because we were told that there was a high likelihood right both the character said this and the narrator came up saying or the text came up on the screen saying you know high chance of a you know pregnant woman you know post fallout would the, the baby has a high chance, the fetus has a high chance of being deformed. Um, and also... Yeah, or dead, even. Or mentally... Like, have a stillborn. Or mentally uh, disabled. That wasn't the word that used on the screen, because this was 1984. I'm cleaning it up a little bit. Thank uh, you. Yeah. For, for, <laughs> for the audience. Um, it began with an R, though. I'll let your imagination mm-hmm. fill in the rest. But yeah. she... You know, she gives birth to this baby, and the baby looks... You know, it's crying, but it looks like a normal baby. And I she thought count, she counts all the fingers and stuff. <laughs> and I thought, oh, maybe this is going to be the hopeful part of you know towards the end of the movie is that she has a baby, and this future generation might be able to like rebuild the you know society. Might might there might be like yeah. some sort of hopeful future. And Plus, this, she has a meal. 
she gets a placenta and <laughs> out of it. Go on, explain that. <laughs> well, she has to cut the umbilical cord, which she uses her teeth, and it's quite disgusting. And then I assume there's placenta. I mean, so, hey, baby and a meal, pretty good day in the post-apocalypse. It's disgusting. <laughs> I had to look away from the screen. This was horrible. <laughs> her chewing away yeah, at this umbilical graphic. cord. It was vile. Oh, God. Um, what is it with the UK post-apocalyptic movies with gross baby I birth know, scenes? I know, they can't help themselves. This is wild. Um, but no, this movie, this this is not the start of a hopeful future. This is not the start of a hopeful ending. The, 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 there is no part of that. We, we cut ahead ten years later at this point, and Ruth has got a ten-year-old daughter, and they're working in the fields. And the text is quite frequent at this point in the movie, every time it cuts ahead, where it's like, Okay, the first crop after, there'll still be some left, and they'll be able to harvest that. But the following years? No, no, the soil's all screwed. Everything's, you know, messed up. The fuel for tractors yeah. and equipment is all gone, so we can't use those. They don't have pesticides, so insects can get all the crops. The uh, crops are, are susceptible to diseases that uh, yep. normally we don't have to worry about. But in, uh, everything... in this we do... Everything it's just so bleak. Is bleak. <laughs> Everything's gone, and it mentions that the population of uh, of the UK is falling back to somewhere around what it was in medieval times, to under eleven million. And so we we cut to like Ruth and her daughter, and this is the one part of the movie where I'm going to just raise a little asterisk and say, "Hey, what what gives here?" Because you're saying this is ten years after the bomb, so this child should be ten. Well, technically nine. She wouldn't be ten yet but mm -hmm. she was born after the bomb. But Ruth looks really old, which, I, I don't know, that may actually be accurate because of the the climate. You know, the may, world, yeah. yeah. yeah the, the world might have made her look, you know, grey and old. Because right, she really shouldn't look that old. Like, if this was someone who was, like, 22 and now they're 32, she should still look pretty she much the same. She has been eating a lot of radioactive sheep, though. Um, oh, yeah, we'll talk about that scene. Um, <laughs> you, you're so guilty of just referencing another scene. The, Talk about it. Tell us what happened at it. Well, after you're done with this thread. <laughs> we'll it's, go back. It's, cute, go it's back. cute when I do it. <laughs> that was just a shallow imitation. I'm sorry. It's, it's embarrassing, frankly. I, I don't I feel pretty good about it. I know. Everyone's cringing at home. Mm. Or in the car. Or in the bathtub. I imagine some people listen to us in the bathtub. Um, you imagine that a lot, huh? <laughs> sure. Yes. Um, I mean, what's it talking about? Oh, yeah. So Ruth's looking old. Um, but the, so this is 10 years later, right? And they cut to what's supposed to be her 10 year old daughter. And I'm like, wait a minute. That's not what a 10 year old looks like. Like, I don't think this world would make someone look like they're 16 when they're only supposed to be 10. <laughs> I don't think that's how it works. It's a harsh world out there. <laughs> That's not how it works, though. You look weaker. You look more frail. This is a this is someone who looks like they're taller and stronger the, the than they should be. The road probably has this right versus this film. Yes. Meaning what? Meaning like the 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 ages of the how comparison to like Vigo and versus the flashbacks and like the age of the kid versus how he acts and stuff like that probably is more correct than like. Uh, this film's depiction of it. I mean, I mean, she looks too old, but there is an interesting pivot here because Ruth just dies in a bed. Like the very next scene is her dying in a bed, and her daughter doesn't cry. Her daughter's not concerned. She just kind of, and she didn't even call her mom. She calls her Ruth, and then just takes mm -hmm. her stuff when she's dead. And it's not like she's not being sneaky about it. It's like I kind of got the impression that this is just the world she's grown up in. Uh, this is just what you do when someone dies. You take their stuff. You don't waste it. And mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like she's been raised where Ruth's like, oh, I'm your mom and you're my daughter. And like, you know, we love each other and we carry the fire <laughs> inside. Like, it feels like a really, <laughs> yeah. it feels like a really cold, bleak world. And Ruth has just raised her and no more. And, you know, part of me thought that the movie was going to say that, you know, because she specifically said when she was pregnant right after the blast, I hate this baby. I wish it was dead. And a part of me thought was, oh, maybe she's going to love the child now, and that's going to be like the kind of the ironies that you know. But 
but even even now that she's dying and her kid's like 10 it, it doesn't feel like there was this warm embrace because she was she did cry holding the baby when she gave birth you know that was like a moment but it doesn't feel like it turned into this like traditional mother-daughter relationship it kind of just feels like i don't know she has a burden now yeah the burden you're just another person like and for a while you were just someone to feed who couldn't work you couldn't contribute anything because you were just a baby that's something that's brought up repeatedly yeah is we, that, do, we do see the that she cries a lot you know so i mean understandably she's crying a lot oh yeah so yeah. i think maybe that's just like now she has the fear of like being found if she's trying to be sneaky or something and hide away it's just so much of a burden having a baby but that, that's something that's said repeatedly in the movie is um, that, you know, once things have, like, after a few weeks and, like, there's, they're trying to organize people and structure things and the food's still quite low and there's rations and all that, is that people who can work are more valuable than people who can't. So the people who can actually do physical labor get, get twice as much food. Um, and the people who can't get the bare minimum because they're not contributing anything. Uh... And then, of course, they point out that when the winter falls, that's like, okay, all the people over a certain age are just gone (laughs) because, like, you know, there's no, there's there's no heating, obviously, that people are making fires, and that's basically all anyone has. And Mm -hmm. even the summer was cold, you know, they point out the the radiation and the fallout, you know, does change the climate, like, it's not like it's a warm summer, so. Yeah. It's, it's all, it's all, uh, it's all very, but anyway, to get back to Ruth and her daughter, so... Ruth dies in the bed and her daughter just takes her stuff and goes about her business. And we get a few scenes of Ruth's daughter. Uh, it cuts another few years, so she's maybe like 13 after a little bit. And she, like, basically she has a little bit of food and these two boys are about the same age. And I can't imagine there's a lot of people of her age, just because, you know, I don't imagine lots of people were having healthy babies um, in the first few years after the the, the bombs. So yeah. these these two boys are kind of trying to get some of her food and saying, hey, give me some, give me some. And it seems like she joins up with them. Um, and then we see them running together as if they've just stolen food from someone else. And one of the boys gets shot from behind. Um, and then you see her and this other boy together briefly. You don't actually see anything happen, though. You just sort of get a quick glimpse saying, oh, they're eating food together. And then almost immediately after that, she goes to like a little makeshift hospital saying she's having a baby. So she gives birth, right? So it's like, oh, she's she's had sex, you know, stupidly young with someone. I th- well, I mean, honestly, I think he takes advantage of her in when they're eating food together. When it's just him and her, it kind of implies that. Does it? Because at Does... first he's like, give me, give me your share of food, and she she fights him, and then it goes into what sounds like. I remember you know, there been a noise. I I remember there being like a. Oh, it, it, that, yeah, Jolica. it just seems to imply that this yeah. is no longer just about food. Yeah, yeah. Which is actually something that I was wondering if the movie was going to get into. Because this is something that comes up and like the road was constantly talking about the possibility of these like, you know, rabid people the, raping yeah, people. Yeah, the Tasha Yar planet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, yeah, I was wondering if it was going to get to that. I, I wasn't necessarily... You're, you're probably right that it was it was forced. It was rape. I, I, mm-hmm. I think... Again, much like the the way people just sort of died off screen and then we found out about it afterwards, I was thinking this was kind of like that, where we just sort of find out afterwards, oh, she's, you know, went through this. Um, that makes us even more depressing, honestly, because what I'm about to say is already absurdly depressing. But the end of this movie is she gives birth and you don't quite see the baby, but you see like, the nurse or whoever wrapping it up and they give her the baby, but you see like a little bit, like, the camera stays on like the, the springs that they had the baby on before. And you just see like some blood on the springs and then they hand her this blanket that's soaked in blood and this baby's clearly dead yeah this is not a living it's baby. not making any noise like yeah, yeah there's, there's no baby crying like the last birth that we got and the final uh, shot yeah. of this movie is ruth's daughter looking down at her dead baby and then it cuts to the title <laughs> threads that's how this movie ends <laughs> that yep. this is the bleakest possible <laughs> this movie's not about oh we can rebuild after the atomic bombs no 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 no. this is we can never let this happen because it's yes. not even it's not just bad initially it's bad afterwards this is 13 years later and there's, there's not no even hope. a glimpse of like a better future in place 
No. <laughs> Oh, You're not dear. going to come across a magic, uh, a magic stronghold or or bunker full of canned food in this film. There's no, there's no hope. No, this is. I mean, yeah, we we obviously were glossed over. So like Ruth, Ruth has a few things she goes through before we skip ahead in time. You know, in the first few months, um, she ends up meeting the friend who, mm -hmm. the guy who was with her with Jimmy, uh, he, that he worked with, the one who convinced yeah, him he to be cheating her. Yeah, he recognizes her. Yeah, he's like, "You're Ruth, right?" Yeah, and they, they, they're together briefly, and one of the main things they do together is they find a dead sheep, and he's like, he's got his little knife out, and he's like, hey, this is probably safe to eat, right? And she's like, I don't know, like, you know, radiation, and he's like, yeah, but it has a thick coat, that'd have protected it, and she's like, you breathe it in, though. <laughs> like, she, yeah, she says, <laughs> well, it didn't die of cold because it's got a really thick hide and or thick matte fur, so um, it died of radiation. <laughs> uh, although he does also have a point when he says we don't really have much of a choice. It's this or starve. Although, when he said we this... could have cooked the meat, though. Well, yeah. yeah. See, see, when, see, when he said that, I thought, oh, they're going to like cut into it and then like you know make a fire and cook the meat. Uh, they go into it like they're zombies. Like, he cuts a hole and yeah, they, they are, just they they dive in. Which mm -hmm. obviously sells how hungry they are. Like, I, you know, I get the purpose of it. Uh, but it is quite nasty. <laughs> like, none yeah. of this is, is appealing. Mm -mm. You know? Um, and it, they, they mentioned how cold it was. Like, it's a winter. So I, I assume they were like, okay, we can, like, bury parts of it. Or not bury, but, like, keep keep it frozen. Because it's yeah. the winter yeah, of, in here. So we can have these, we can cook parts of it as we go. Um, and that should help us survive for... Um, I don't know, like a week between the two of them or something. Yeah. Maybe oh, longer, I don't know. They don't stay together after this, though. Uh, I just kind of assume he dies because we see her solo. Yeah. Uh, maybe because he eats too much of this meat. <laughs> That's clearly, like, really, yeah. really bad for you. Um, and I think this comes after as well. There's like a little scene where, like, the police are actually relocating people into buildings that are still standing, and they go up to this house, and this old man, is, and the policeman's like, hey, you have to take four people in. The records here show you've got four spare bedrooms. And he's like, I don't want strangers in my house. And he's like, tough. Like, you have to take four. This is the law. Um, but then the old guy throws them all out immediately after. Like, he just throws their stuff out and says, get lost. Mm -hmm. You're not welcome in here. Um, which, you know, uh, I, I, I can sympathize why he's not really adjusted to this idea that the world's not the same anymore. He still sees this as his place. <laughs> but, oh, you know, man. Mm -hmm. but you know like most other people's places are rubble like <laughs> they're mostly gone it, things are pretty dire yeah i mean you gotta we always see like people solo in these movies right people just kind of on their own or just with immediate family or some some like one companion um we don't really see like groups of people building a civilization of some kind no. but this movie kind of tries to like Look, we can all benefit from crops if we all work together. Um, but it, it, for the most part, like no one's, I don't know, like it, like even the friend who's there for a little while, it's only a few months after maybe or a couple months after the bomb. So he's probably like, I just am happy to see a familiar face and that's why he's with her for a while. But like for the most part, it's still, yeah. I, I think it's cool that this movie shows that people are trying to not build a civilization, but like, work together you know for a little bit at least um but yeah this guy is definitely uh cutting his ways and um reminds me of the lady from the chernobyl miniseries who's just like i'm not leaving my farm <laughs> that's all i know <laughs> don't take this away from me too farm i don't remember a farm in chernobyl yeah they like kill the cow so that she has to leave she's there milking her cow Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, I barely remember that now. Um, yeah, I think one of the things we point out is that after the bombs, this movie's exceptionally dirty. Like, there's just constant dirt everywhere, water dripping. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, one of the most, like, one of the first sort of really shocking shots, I thought, is that not long after the bomb, maybe a few days after, it's uh, Jimmy's dad goes out trying to find water, and there's, like, water dripping in the rubble, and he holds out his hands to try and get this water. And the two things that stuck out to me about this shot is that the water looks brown. It looks dirty and disgusting. But not only that, like that once you've stopped paying attention to that, you notice there's a burned like skull like behind like in the darkness just behind it. 
and it's like he's literally getting dirty water in front of this corpse and it's just uh, that, this was the yeah. part of the movie where I'm like, oh shit, they're actually not pulling punches with all the, the shit they're showing here. Like, they're actually mm-hmm. showing people sick, they're showing people losing their hair, they're showing people with, like, half-burned faces, uh, and all these corpses, then they're not holding back at all. And I was surprised there's by a, that. There's another scene where a guy, like, drops down to the ground because he sees, like, a, a tiny little puddle of water, like the small, like, in a mm. in a footprint or something, and just drinks it but it, it looks like mud like it looks disgusting yeah and, and it, it's around all the rubble too so it's just like whatever i can get um also i mean this is pretty close after the the, the immediate aftermath of the bomb but we see a couple where she's like asking for a drink and he goes to the, like he goes to the sink that has been working and sees that the water has been cut off but it's still like kind of coming out and like desperately gra- gra- grabs a bowl or something to to catch it and by the time it gets the bowl there the water is just completely dry it was a good shot good timing yeah yeah there was a lot of those little touches uh throughout so yeah i mean i I think ultimately the movie sets up very natural realistic characters that aren't necessarily super likable or unlikable for the most part they're just kind of normal people but that Mm kind of helps when it's like oh no the world goes to shit and then we have to see them all suffer like this and it is suffering there's no there's no emotional arc or journey it's just it's just surviving until a sad pathetic lonely death and then the daughter's survival after that is is yeah the next generation is not our next hope no if it (laughs) yeah like i I wouldn't say it's worse per se but like you know and i think that's where you really start to see um all the post-apocalyptic vibes in this like 10 years 13 years later period um yeah there's a scene where, and this maybe ties into the whole idea that this movie's meant to feel like a docu-drama thing you'd show in a school, is there's a scene 13 years in the future where effectively a school class, is, but it's just like a group of like eight or nine kids, are sitting in this old building and someone's hooked up a TV with whatever electricity they've got and they're watching this worn out ancient VHS tape of this uh, like cartoon, like inf- you know, again it's an informative school video talking about skeletons and things and they're saying this is the skeleton of a cat by the way there was a lot of dead cats in this as well uh did not appreciate i was hugging my babies watching this one (laughs) i did see in the in the trivia um um, it's like the 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 first trivia thing that pops up is that there's a shot of a cat getting like falling over and stuff like that but it's actually done it's a reverse shot because they just gave a cat a bunch of catnip and it just like passed down <laughs> that's good that's, I like but that. it made it look like he was he like he had fallen down because of the blast yeah because that's like that's basically right right after the blast you see these quick shots of this cat trying to stand up as if it's like mm-hmm. weaker you know heart um, it's just high <laughs> well that's nice to know <laughs> it's, it's nice to know that it's this the cat's fine uh, and no harm <laughs> I, I, I'm sure I, all the cats are fine in this. I almost cheered though, because like you see like three different dead cats while Ruth's wandering on all the rubble, and I thought, what is this? Like, where's the dead dogs? Like, and so when a dead dog finally showed up, I almost cheered. I was like, finally, yeah, a dog. How dare you? <laughs> Can't just all be dead cats. Come on now. It's the only thing that can kill a cat. <laughs> what is the nuclear blast? Mm-hmm. They're like roaches. Oh, that's just it. oh, how dare you? <laughs> it's okay i'm still pro cat despite the beginning of this review uh-huh um yeah so i'm just you know the, the, the movie paints a very bleak picture uh that feels at, at least within the realms of believability you know it, mm-hmm. most of the stuff it's doing feels like it's based on a fair amount of uh good genuine study and i'm sure there's maybe some small things that actual people with you know backgrounds in this type of radiation or who have studied nuclear blasts will probably say oh well here's the things they got wrong but it does feel much like chernobyl it does feel like a lot of thought went into it and like it's designed to be this warning not through emotional characters who cry as they're losing their loved ones there's a little bit of that but it's all very down to earth Stiff upper lip, though. um it's more like no we're just going to show how bleak it would be after how bleak it'll be a month yeah. after, how bleak it'll be a year after, and here's the next generation, and they're like, and these are people who've grown up without the civilization that everyone, you know, 
all the people who survived the blast, they grew up in a world from before, so they remember civilization and the sort of things they're, they're trying to like fight for. But these kids who are growing up after it, like they don't even know what the world was like before. They're like they are more savage because they don't understand what what it was like. Um, yeah. So yeah, and not just that, but the movie kind of paints that this is the last generation because mm. kids are not going to be able to effectively have children like a lot of them are the ones that get pregnant like it's very likely that the babies won't survive or you know it, it is kind of like this is the end of humanity yeah despite yeah. who lives on um i don't know maybe australia's fine i don't know <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe no one bombed australia so there's at least one island of civilization still functioning <laughs> i don't know um, save the good looking people <laughs> you think australians are particularly good looking i mean they have a pretty high ratio that's because all the australians you see are the ones that become actors and shit <laughs> I, i've been to australia <laughs> okay fair enough i didn't know that <laughs> why would i assume you've been to australia i haven't told you i've been to sydney and Cairns. you've told me many places it's, you've it... been but i do not remember australia on that list I've been to Australia. They are very pretty down there. Okay. So okay. it's not fair. Yes, but they also may die from any random spider, snake, or flower. That... It's true. It, like only the harshest, beautiful people can survive. <laughs> it's so funny to me that New Zealand is like right next to them and has all the beauty, but none of the deadly <laughs> like creatures. I know. It's weird. Well, except for mines. There's like apparently there's a lot of like mines left over from war or whatever <laughs> in New Zealand. Oh, I thought you meant mines as in, like, you know, like, where you go to mine, like, a resource. <laughs> no, like, I was like, there's a lot of caverns um, like that people mines. have fallen into. <laughs> Everyone, there's always a chance you'll just fall into an old abandoned mine. <laughs> I was like, that's a really they specific have problem. out there, I think, yeah. Bauxite mines. <laughs> uh, yes, land mines, yes. Definitely, definitely a concern. Um, but yeah. So... Yeah, well, that's the rides. I, I, I think we, I think we covered all the the important stuff that I wanted to talk about. Um, and there's some you other stuff. You mentioned the guy on the toilet. Oh yeah, when the bomb goes off, there's a guy sitting and having a shit. Yeah, I think I think that's one of the <laughs> dads. Hell? I think that's one of the dads because it's the first blast. Yeah, that goes off yeah. when he's sitting in the toilet seat. Before it's a curious, the, the uh, one. curious. Well, it's like the only moment of levity in the whole film. <laughs> I think it's just meant to show that you can literally be on the toilet seat when this happens. <laughs> What's this now? <laughs> I don't think he said that, but <laughs> I no, appreciate that. I, I think you said bloody hell. Bloody hell. Yes. Um, <laughs> hey, if I'm going to go, I think I'd like to go when I'm sitting on the toilet seat. We see people piss themselves and stuff. At least if you're sitting in the toilet seat, you're, you're good for the evacuation. Right. Everything's ready. <laughs> That's a very good point, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's a very good point. Anyway, like no. nice and lightweight for for when you have to run. Oh yes, yes, yes. Oh yeah, because running will help in a nuclear blast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unless you happen to be right at the edge of the affected running, area. Running to a shelter? I don't know. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Run to a shelter. All right, that's that's threads. Uh, if you have seen it, and it is relatively easy to see because it is on Tubi, like Tara said in the US. Um, so. You can you can have a look uh and you know tell us what you think of the movie in the comments all the usual stuff it does help out a lot if you do uh but yeah that that'll wrap us up um so we're continuing with post apocalyptic season next episode uh so join us for that but um you can of course support all the content over at patreon.com slash mailfuzz tv and so on and so forth yeah, i know we've not rated yet i'm gonna i'm getting to that I can see, I can see you getting ready to jump in and be like, Peter, you've forgotten something. It's, I, it's okay. We can keep, we keep rolling. Uh huh. Yes. Like, subscribe, all that stuff. Uh, get bonus content, support all the stuff and keep it coming. Uh, yes. What would you rate threads, Tara? I think that I, I definitely think that this movie is probably in the seven range, but because I was surprised at how much I liked it, I was surprised at how much the, um, uh, I don't know. Like it is, it does feel like an important cautionary tale, very specific, maybe to its time, but maybe, uh, maybe now again also. So, 
Um, I'm going to bump it up to an eight. I actually okay. quite enjoy this a lot. Yeah, I think as of its time, it's definitely obviously born out of the, the Cold War and the threat of nuclear annihilation, which even though we think of the 80s as being towards the tail end of that, because obviously the fall of the Soviet Union uh, came at the end of the decade, but still very much in there and uh, is definitely a product of that time. But, you know, the, the actual study of what the effects would be seems just as relevant. Like, uh, if, if things actually mm-hmm. go down and happen, this would this is a still good, you know, exploration of that. So, um... Yeah, I think I have to go with the eight as well. I think it's it's it also surprised me. I think like I got what it was doing in the first half, but it's that second half. It's it's when the bomb hits where you realize just how much effort's went into uh, showing that and showing the effects afterwards. It is a bit late, obviously, in having characters that have arcs, which is something you look for in ninety nine things out of a hundred when it comes to. A movie you know when it comes to you know storytelling that's what you're typically looking for that's not to say that it doesn't do little things to make you care in the moment or make you care about the fact that someone's dead you get this kind of like shock of like oh these people are already dead this loved one's already dead i mean that happens repeatedly throughout it um but it is definitely different to a typical story in a movie even a story of this even if you did the exact same premise it would be told very differently by anyone else in any other time period. You know, if Hollywood made this, it would be very, very different. So, um, yeah. you know, so, but in some ways, it being so unconventional and down to earth is what gives it so much of its bite and effect. So, um, yeah, I, I would still give it a solid eight, I think. That's good. Good job, BBC. I'm just assuming BBC because they referenced the BBC in the movie. I don't actually know if they're the ones that aired it but i mean it's oh, 19 I say yes. it's 1984 so they've only really got two choices it's either bbc or itv <laughs> so it's probably bbc is itv a bunch of kid shows no 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 no. canada had an itv and that's how i watched kids shows it was on itv i mean they have a kids block like a lot of the channels did back then and i think they had citv which was children's itv on cable when that eventually launched hmm. if I, I think citv this was also, in like early 90s yeah i think citv is what they called the block where they showed kids stuff if i remember correctly but it's been a long time hmm. Maybe. yeah they, they had art attack that was one of the only things i watched on itv i don't know what that is i didn't think you would but i, I threw it out there for the for the dozen of you in the audience who will get the reference to art attack you're welcome <laughs> I know. Are you being served? Um, you're just naming cats. You're naming These are the British ones. I know. You're naming random British shows. You're not even naming kids shows. No. I, well, no. ITV when I watched it had like. Oh, okay. Are you afraid of the dark? <laughs> oh, that's Nickelodeon. No. I yeah, but it's Canada. We didn't have Nickelodeon, so we would have Wait. like Nickelodeon shows. Some Nickelodeon shows on ITV. But we had Nickelodeon. How did how did the UK have Nickelodeon, but Canada's like, no, we've got the knockoff brand. <clears throat> I am four years older than you, so it could just be that the Nick- Nickelodeon came eventually. I guess. But but Are You Afraid of the Dark was a Canadian show. Oh, so you're saying it was a it was a an ITV original? Is what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But, a CITV, which stands for Canada. Can- Canada <laughs> ITV. ITV, okay. <laughs> All right, there you go. That's Threads, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it. Keep watching science fiction and computer at Salsa.